Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Reed. Unfortunately, Hall will not be joining us this evening. Make sure you let him know that you miss him. The Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. We are rejoined by brother of the podcast, Michael Reed's best friend, Mr. Logan Paulson of the Washington Commanders. How are you doing tonight, brother? I'm excellent, man. Now that I'm getting to talk to you guys, this is very exciting. We've been trying to work this out for a while, so it's good to finally... See you face to face. I yeah, feel like no. you're always flirting with us. You always say that. You're always like, good now when I'm talking to you. Well, I mean, hey, you, know, so I don't, you want me to lie? I can't lie. I got to be no, yeah, true. I feel like you are kind of like George thinking. Washington. Yeah. Which brings <laughs> us into our last, the history podcast now. Yes. So. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that's later on down the road. But Logan, I got to get your opinion because I'm not sure if you're on Twitter, but Twitter has been up and rise. There's a lot of fans questioning Ron Rivera's comments from the owners meeting the past couple days out in Arizona where he said that they are now roster building so a lot of fans are saying well haven't you been building like now you're building so if you can kind of explain what you in your terms what you think coach Rivera means by that I mean I think if you're looking around the NFL like every team is always roster building like there's no established roster so like the idea that they're building a roster yeah you're working on something right there's areas of the roster that need to be fleshed out Obviously, you have some financial restrictions now that Payne's contract has been signed. So I think that's perfectly reasonable. That's that's uh, that's my expectation is that they're always doing stuff like that. And plus, this is roster building season, you know, free agency season, draft season, all that stuff's around. So I don't really have any problem with him saying it like that. You know, sometimes his wording gets misconstrued or whatever. But I do think that that's that's what they should be thinking about now. And obviously, like once the roster is established going into the offseason, going into training camp, even then you're still roster building. You're looking for guys to get cut late. I mean, think about how they signed Charles Leno really late after right. the draft two years ago. So it's always it's always part of the process. So it, it doesn't bother me, you know, like, hey, man, you should be. That's what he should be thinking about right now. Um, could he have ordered it differently? Maybe, but th- th- this should be a roster construction time of year. Yeah, it's not like Coach Rivera at the moment is saying, oh, now we're building the roster. I mean, they've been building the roster since he got here. I mean, we, yeah. I think we all know I that. see what you're saying. Yeah. It's That's also not like he said we're rebuilding. Like, yeah. If that was the case, then it'd be like, okay. But yeah, every team's always <laughs> building. But yeah. uh, one position of the draft, of course, you have turned into quite the draft expert, Logan. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Top, now top, who's top. flirting with who? <laughs> maybe it's me i don't know uh, but one of my favorite position classes one of the most interesting that's is too of course, natural for you that's weird. that's okay i'm an ally shut up kyle um what <laughs> uh one of the most <laughs> interesting positions to me has been tight end and of course you being a former tight end you know mm-hmm. him better than anybody right i've seen a lot of changes early in the season it was like michael mayer's the number one tight end now mm-hmm. people have a bunch of different who is your top tight end and who is a sleeper Oh, that's a good question. So I will say, I think my top tight end is probably Dalton Kincaid. And I, and the only reason I say that, is I just think he's got a little bit more athletic upside. I think he catches the football really well. He reminds, he reminds me a lot of like Dennis Pitta. I don't know if that name is yeah, it resonates yeah, with yeah. the fan base, former Baltimore tight end guy that, you know, moves really well, good route runner, understands zones, has enough kind of plus athleticism uh, that kind of scares you and makes you think he could be a feature of the offense. Unlike Michael Mayer, who's, you know, bigger body guy, but smaller than people thought he'd be good in line, not great, good in the passing game, not great. The thing that he does that I think is that I've undervalued in the past is he is really good from a technical route running standpoint, understanding stems, understanding coverages, understanding how to use his kind of more physical frame to create separation on contact. So different type of guy, more of a complete guy like Dalton Kincaid is I think a willing blocker, but he's not great in the run game, but I think he really excels as a pass catcher. So I'm just going to give him the slightest of edges just because I think I can see a path to him having a role on an NFL team. And if we're looking for a guy that I think is uh, a little bit of a sleeper, it's Kuntz from Old Dominion. He's a guy that I know a lot of people aren't talking about nationally because um, and it can really score. Yeah. So really it's just because he's a tremendous athlete, right? He's six, seven, you're at a four, five, Former five-star recruit. Yeah, he had like a crazy vertical. I want to say it was 40 inches, yeah, yeah, 38 something like inches, that. something like that. At what, 6'7 or something? Yeah, so when you see a guy like that, you're kind of like, 
that's a skill set. Like, you know, I, I have my calls with my buddies around the league, and one of the things they say is, like, that's the guy everyone's looking at, and it's because of that RAS score. He's right. big, he's tall, he's long, and that's kind of the way the position, position's going. Like, think about basketball players translating really well. Mm. It's a traits-driven position. Uh, the other the other guy is the kid from Miami whose name escapes me at the Will moment. Will Mallory? Yes. Um, again, kind of high pass game upside. But I think that's the cool thing about this class. There's a lot of guys who are good football players. You know, kid yeah. from Penn State's pretty solid. Kid from Iowa State is – is ex- or Iowa is exceptional. Um, like he's going to be a good pro. Like, yeah. it's just th- – that's the cool thing about this class is, is you know – it's not just there's two guys and we got to kind of make a decision and fight for those two guys. It's like, there's a lot of different skill sets throughout of guys that um, I think are pretty good football players. So yeah. Now real fast, you said something in there and it bugged me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. You said when you call your friends around the league and I've called you about 15 times a day for the last two months, and you always ignore it. You have not called me. I I wait for you to call me. I okay. shoot you texts that you leave me on red. Like it's, I mean, this Logan's is a one-sided doing a great job here because he just he wants he's to, he, he's not telling the truth. Yeah. And the truth is that his wife said, stop answering those calls. <laughs> this guy is, needs to be put in right. an asylum. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't blame her. And speaking of, I got to ask you about free agency so far, yeah. Logan. Um, Cole Holcomb left. I think that was kind of a shock to everybody that's leading tackle on the defense. And obviously, it's not the end-all, be-all. But they went and got Cody Barton, who is a really good tackler for the Seahawks in limited amount of snaps. What did you think of that free agent move with Cody Barton? Do you think that they brought him in to be the starter to replace Cole? I mean, that's kind of the conversation now. You know, I think when you watch his film, he's a guy that is definitely – ascending he's playing better you know he hasn't been a starter he was a converted safety uh playing behind bobby wagner and then when bobby wagner left that's when he got his excuse me opportunity to play some football and so uh obviously he's kind of he's doing that did at a high level excuse me i think the thing about him that sticks out is he's really good as a as a pass defender which i think is something that's very very valuable for this team right he's kind of understands zone Owns, oh. understands uh, route concepts, understands where to fit. And I think that all that stuff is, is exceptional. Now he does have some, he does have a hard time taking on blocks. He doesn't always fit the gaps the right way. Hard to tell in that Seattle defense. Cause I feel like that D line wasn't doing him any favors. Mm. So, you know, what does he look like with another year under his belt behind a much better defensive line um, in a system where I don't want to say they insulate the linebackers, but they don't, they, they do stress the linebackers, but they stress them in a way that I think speaks to uh, Cody's skill set and that, you know, from a coverage standpoint, hmm. he kind of understands zones, like I said, understands where to fit in concepts and coverages. So um, is he going to be the starter? I don't know. Um, I think you could always draft a guy. I think there's some very talented, you know, this this my, this linebacker's class has kind of been much maligned. But I do think there are some talented guys that could come in and provide some depth. And um, But I do think Cody was a nice signing, and um, hopefully he can fill Cole's shoes. And what you and I just want to get elaborate on that because I feel like I know what you're talking about when you're talking about like what Cody Barton fitting in this scheme and going to his strengths or weaknesses. You mean like what they're this defense, what they're asking the linebackers to do? The stress level is more so in pass coverage in that level more than it is in the ground game because the D line helps them in that. Case. So I, I think that's more of a philosophical thing. I think okay. you know. offenses in the NFL are designed to attack the middle of the defense, meaning your linebackers, your nickels, those types of players, those less efficient coverage players. And so um, I don't, this is going to maybe be a little bit um, controversial, but I don't really care how a linebacker plays the run as Mm -hmm. much anymore. Like for me, when I'm watching film, when I'm evaluating guys, it's really like, how do you cover, how do you fit in concepts? Because from a pass game standpoint, like that's where they're going to hit you. That's where they're going to attack you. And I think, um, you know, like comparing him to Jamin, like Jamin, I think has tremendous athleticism. He's fitting the run much better, but in order to kind of take that next step, he needs to understand coverages a little bit better. And I think Cody, I would give the, I would give him an edge in that department, right? He just kind of fits in nicely, gets his hands on a lot of footballs in okay. terms of batting him down and, and reading route concepts. So again, he's not a perfect player, but I think some of his strengths are things that they've lacked at the second level of the defense, you know, when you compare him to Mayo or Bostic or even Jamin to a certain extent, he's got a better feel for, for that element of the game um, that I think is becoming more valuable uh, now that people are throwing the football so much. I'm smelling right. what you're smoking, Logan. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to cut back on that. But uh, one of the things that I've been struggling with lately, besides my identity is um, the, what, what direction they're going to go in round one. Cause right. like they, uh, they address the offensive line, pretty well i think i don't think that there's a guard necessarily that they would take at 16 
cornerback, I know like historically Ron Rivera hasn't gone after quarterbacks in round one. Where do you think that they go? What what direction are you kind of looking at? I mean, right now, I think in terms of in terms. So like one of the things they've done in free agency is they've made sure that you haven't you don't have to draft anybody at this spot. Right. Right. You don't have to kind of target a position because, you know, prior to free agency, it was like, oh, they need an alignment. They need a DB, whatever it is. I personally think the value for where they'll be picking will probably be defensive back. I think a guy like Joey Porter Jr., Deontay Banks, that type of guy um, is going to be very valuable. I, you know, personally, I think they they're going to try their best to trade back. Right. You know, because I okay. think the difference between Joey Porter and Deontay Banks is not as... that high or as high as people want to say, right. right? It's it's kind of negligible. So trade back at a pick, maybe put yourself in contention for like a Darnell Wright, Dewan Jones, one of those types of guys. I think that's um that's kind of what I would be looking at because I do think that you know, while those top guys are good football players, those tackles specifically, I think they're all gonna be off the board um when uh when washington's picking and i think those top two corners are probably going to be off the board around the same time so you know this is somewhat controversial but i also think that they could potentially draft an edge player so if a guy like lucas van s slides to you at 16 i I think there's a there's a pretty good chance that they pick that guy imagine the fan base if that happens they would go crazy but in terms of think about this it makes sense yeah you talked about them taking a defensive tackle early last year yeah and that yeah, right. Exactly. And in terms of value, right, in terms of positions that make a lot of money, edge rusher, right, and look at the contract situation of Montez and Chase, and uh, Chase is kind of nebulous fifth year option. And look at what this defense does, man, they really value kind of exceptional power rushers off the edge and guys that fit in and can play off those guys that just paid a lot of money to inside. So even though it sounds crazy, like, if like Lucas Van Ness is the name that comes to mind, who could be there at 16, if he's available, I wouldn't, it's not like I'd be surprised if they drafted him. And I think he's going to help this team because in terms of what they want to be defensively, they kind of play these wide nines, kind of forcing everything back inside to Jamin, to John, to Allen. They got big Ridgeway in there now. Like it's just going to constrict running lanes. And then from a pass game standpoint, they don't really want creative edge rushers the way that some other teams do. They want guys to compress the pocket. So do I think they're going to go that way? I don't know. Would I be surprised if they did? No. So I I would probably say DB at 16. (laughs) If there's no one there you like, I'd expect a trade back unless one of these edge rushers is there that they really have a high grade on, and then I could see that happening as well. I love it. Now, to wrap this up, Logan, only a couple more questions for you. But let's just, in a general standpoint for the commanders, out of this draft class, what is the best-case scenario for them, In the let's just say in the first three rounds, like in hitting those positions based on where the value you believe is? Yeah, so I think 16 is probably the most compelling because, you know, like at 48, I thought there was a really good chance that a guy like early, early mock draft, I'm talking before the senior bowl, that a guy like Darnell Wright, right. a guy like Dewan Jones would be there. And I thought, well, then you it, this is simple. You draft a DB at 16, you draft one of those guys at, at 48. But obviously, like because of kind of the composition of this draft and because of the strengths of this draft, tackles are going to get pushed up. And I could definitely see six guys getting drafted in the first round. So by those guys, it's Skaronsky, it's uh, Paris Johnson, it's Roderick Jones, Darnell Wright, Anton Harrison, and Dwan Jones, right? Those right. are your six guys I expect to kind of see uh, get drafted in the sixth round. So that leaves you like a Matthew Bergeron in the second. That leaves you in terms of tackle. And so then you say, well, is there value there, right? right. And then Osiris Torrance is probably going to be a first-round player as well. So John Michael Jingleheimer Schmitz yeah, is going he, to be the second-round pick. More than well, likely. he's been mocked now in the first round. Really? Yeah. All these because again, the, the the that's the funny thing about the draft this year is yeah. the the offensive line is kind of a strength, and so usually that strength would kind of be trickled over the first two rounds. But because the other positions are not overly strong, there's not a very dynamic receiver class, right? Um, there's not an overly dynamic defensive tackle class. The edge is pretty good. Um, that those tackles are going to get pushed into the first round. Because think about positional value. Think about it from an economy standpoint, right? So those are the positions that get paid the most money. Edge rusher, tackle, quarterback, receiver. They're going to get pushed in the first round, even though the value might not necessarily be there. So that's what I'm expecting. So in terms of draft flow, I think you're taking the best player available at 16. Probably DB. Deontay Banks is one that I think is very, very compelling. I like him a little bit better than Joey Porter Jr. But if they mm-hmm. went Joey Porter Jr., I wouldn't freak out. And again, I want them to trade back badly. At the yeah. 48, then because of that thing I just talked about with the tackles, I think you're probably looking center. 
Um, I think John Michael Schmitz probably goes. A guy that I would kind of call attention to is Tipman from Wisconsin. Yep, love Tipman. He's excellent. Yeah. And Whippler from Ohio State, yeah. also very excellent and would fit kind of this run first. And the, the thing about those both of those guys is they'll come in and start day one, right? Yeah. I kind of would probably lean tip, Tipler, Tipler over Whippler. Mm. Tip, is that Tipman, right? Tipman. Tipman over Whippler. Thank you. Jeez. <laughs> Tipler, Tipler, over, Tipler Whippler. over Whippler. And I was like, that's not right. And then because I think he can play also play guard. So yeah. I'd probably go that direction just slightly because I think he gives you some more position flexibility. But both are excellent football players, right? So um, that's something I would probably keep an eye on. Then running back is someone else I would keep an eye on um, in terms of finding that third down pass catcher. Now, do you need to do that in round three? Absolutely not. Do you need to do that in round four? Absolutely not. Can you do it in round five, six, seven? Probably. And I think there are some guys who are very dynamic, very fast football players that um, are going to be there. So in terms of the third round selection, I would expect them to find a guy if they don't draft an edge in the first round, probably a rotational edge piece. Guy with some pass rush juice, fits schematically what they want to do. And as long as all those guys don't get pushed up the board too high, um, I think there will be someone there for them to select in the third round with that. Next question, hypothetically speaking, let's say Washington goes against the grain, does what Ron Rivera has not done in taking a tackle or a guard in the first round. Let's say that does happen. Who are some cornerbacks in the second round? You know, you've already said you think Banks probably goes in the first. He's up there with you, and I would agree in that second round. That's, I would love Banks in that scenario. But mm-hmm. who are some cornerbacks you would love in that second round if they were to go that direction? Yeah, so I think it's a good question. Um, at 48, I'd say it depends because I, I, I could see Emmanuel Forbes is a name that comes to mind. I don't, he might be a first round player. Sam Smith might be a first round player. Like Love his music. Uh, the, the other corner from, um, the other Cam corner Smith. from, uh, yeah, Cam, Cam Smith. Yeah, Cam Smith. <laughs> why, and then, why is Sam Smith, why are you always thinking about him? <laughs> and then rush from uh the two south yeah Carolina dude courts. i like yeah i like rush they're both they're both good football players and they'll be there and then obviously um tyreek stevenson from miami again julius probably brents a... six yeah. yeah yeah julius brents i know a lot of people like him it'd be interesting to see if he creeps in the second round there um you know i think he's an interesting guy because his film is just okay but his testing numbers were awesome especially oh, yeah. from like the l drill and the five ten five. so a little bit of, of uh, benjamin st juice i was gonna say yeah a little bit of benjamin st mm-hmm. juice not as smooth as benjamin st juice and his, little his head doesn't flap open when he talks that is true yeah a <laughs> little little hitch to his giddy up when he does his turns and stuff but uh yeah that, that's an interesting prospect he kind of feels more like a like a third round guy to me but i could definitely see him because of those height weight speed type of measurements moving into that second round area so you know, like this is a very deep cornerback class. It's a very deep edge rusher class. The top of this tackle class is fun. It's got some depth, but how long does that depth spread? Because again, that's a position that's going to get elevated quite a bit. So, um, you know, in terms of guards and stuff, I think there are some guys in the second round that are going to be tremendously valuable. Like Cody Mock is an interesting guy. Um, Avili from DCU yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. is an interesting guy as well. So like, there's a lot of good football players. It's just about who's going to be available. Cause like, right. It's kind of a I don't want to say it's a sh- it's 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 an interesting draft this year, right? There's well, not like the the same peak and um how long are the legs going to go because again there's no really like dynamic receivers that are going to help push some of these guys back down the board. So Yeah. A lot of the I've heard that a lot of the guys like from the first round are rated really closely together like in the first day and a half or so of the draft yeah. like they're all kind of bunched together so you're not really dropping I think that's much. a really good uh, description of what's going on. And, yeah. and and then what that does, though, unfortunately, is it does kind of make it hard to project who's going to be in the second round area at 48 right. and who's going to be a first round player. So, yeah, yeah, really hoping those quarter uh, quarterbacks go heavy in that early first. So those DBs fall to us. But so, I mean, I kind of want see this is me. This is I'm glad you brought that up because I kind of hope one of those quarterbacks slides. And the yeah, reason we I want to trade back, I see what so you're you saying. Trade back because yeah, yeah, I think yeah. you need someone to fall out of there. I got you. whether it's Jalen Carter you know, Ty, uh, Tyree Wilson, one of those guys to kind of slide down the board a little bit to get someone antsy enough to trade up with Do you. Do you think so, that yeah. somebody would won't be willing to jump Dallas to get Bijan at 16? Have you that's a really good that? that's a really good question um dallas is picking when early 20s 20 no, oh, 19 okay oh they're picking 19 okay yeah um yeah 
So I would would Dallas jump? I don't know if Dallas would jump. Bijan's interesting because he's like uh, kind of the classic bucket breaker, right. blue chip prospect. He's probably the second best non quarterback in the class. Um, probably the second best football player. You know, very respective of position, but running backs have become so devalued. And like I mentioned, this uh, this running back class has super long legs. Right. So like, do you want to be wasting draft capital so now? A team like Dallas might, and that would be. I personally don't think that's a good move, right? Because there's a lot of good running backs, but you know, if Dallas wants to make that mistake, I'm down for that. So hey, it's Jerry's hey. world, Logan. We're just <laughs> real fast, real it. fast. Who's your number one quarterback? Who's your top quarterback? You don't have to explain why. Just Bryce Young, man. It's easy. Thank that, you. It's not, easily. It's not that's my question. king. You're it's not even a, a question yeah. because uh, I mean, when you watch the film, man, he's like, he's that dude. He just does all the little things. He anticipates. He's got great pocket <laughs> awareness. He's got great kind of off schedule planning. Like he's got good arm strength. But he just sees the field in, a, yeah. in an elite way. If he's six two, he's in that same category as Trevor Lawrence. That's, like, what that's I've heard. how people yeah. are talking right, about him. Right. And you know, obviously everyone's talking about, you know, Anthony Richardson, all this stuff, but you know, he's 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 that he's that dude in my opinion. So yeah, I got you. Yeah. Logan, last yeah. question I have for you. I know you got to get out of here, so we you can make this as brief as you like it to. But you know, let's just say the possibility out there for the realistic chance that it could happen, zero to ten, if new ownership takes over taking a swing on one of those big name quarterbacks yeah i mean that's a good question it really depends on the guy and their vision and their management style you know and i think um i mean do you have a one in mind like because lamar well huh who lamar lamar yeah caleb williams next year yeah so caleb williams is like he's on real football jesus so you know if you get a shot at him like go for it but um you know with regards to lamar i mean that's that guy's call you know do you want to kind of give up all that financial um space and draft capital to bring him in and do you think he can elevate a franchise obviously he'd be fun to watch but um i think that's really an ownership decision i don't think ron's going to make that decision from a football standpoint i would love that decision i think uh you know i'm I, i love lamar i think he's a great football player but you know his injury history um it, it, it gives me pause to be giving him guaranteed money. And so I know fans want him here. They want him here badly. But um, I ju- I would just say, look at the financial situation. Look at the scheme that would have to come in. And do you think he's going to elevate you to the tune of being 30% of your salary cap? Right. I don't know. There's a, there's only one or two guys in the league that I would say definitively yes. And they're locked into long-term deals for a reason. So, so but are you comfortable saying just zero out of 10 to pop the, you, what you think it's possible of that happening? That they would, that the new owner would. Yeah, so, I know it's not, it's not your call. It's not because you wouldn't know what they would do. But at this point, would I, would I be comfortable with the, the new ownership trading for Lamar? Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Okay. I know, I know. There's a lot of fans that want that, but I think when you step back and objectively look at it, like that's a lot of money, man. That's a lot of money, and if I'm paying that kind of money, I want a certain degree of certainty, and. The only I only think of a couple of players that I would give that kind of money for, you know, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, um, Patrick Mahomes, right? Um, John Allen or Jonathan Allen, excuse me, Josh um, Allen. Josh Allen. Jesus what is up Christ. with you and your names today, dog? I'm just wires crossed. Something's going on. It's yeah. the CT man. Ever it since it catches Smith. up to everybody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Catches yeah. up for everybody. Um, yeah. So Josh Allen, like those are the types of guys, and I'm not sure that I would put Lamar in that category. And and I know there are some people that would, and this is my subjective opinion, and I haven't like evaluated him, but in the limited snaps that I did watch of Baltimore last year, I was like, is he truly like an elite guy? Is he a true top five guy in the NFL? And I'm sure you get some people say yes, but I I don't know. I don't know. Based on his play, based on the way that the position's going and and the style of play is going. So does that mean that they won't do that? No. Does it does it would it mean that this organization would all of a sudden be relevant and super fun to watch? Yeah. Is there a value there to an owner? Absolutely. So it's it's their call. But from a football standpoint, and again, I'm I'm probably overly conservative when it comes to this stuff, but I would always kind of just be pumping the brakes on that type of thing. I always appreciate your time, Logan, as always, man. Uh, from the Take the Command podcast, thank you enough, brother. Enjoy your evening. National treasure this guy is. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Nicholas you. Cage might steal you if you don't watch out. Oh, gosh. <laughs> man, right, Logan, so much have flirting a today. All right, later, guys. <laughs> That's what I do. Oh, man. I know. You just love making it awkward.
He loves flirting with me. It's so funny. He's he just always. Doing that. I have yeah. heard that. I have heard that. Um, before we are go any further and joined by our next guest for the rest of the episode, uh, did you want to do a prospect breakdown today? I, I, we didn't talk about it earlier, so I never actually got if you have somebody for today. I mean, I can find somebody, but I won't be able to go first. I'll have to scroll up on my. So notes. unfortunately for me, um, I went off a whim because yesterday I I didn't do an, a film breakdown on Twitter, but I watched the film on Michael Mayer again. Um, just mm-hmm. because I've watched the other tight ends. Um, I did want to put this conceited point in there that I asked Logan last time he was on here about Zach Kuntz, actually. So it's not your guy. It's my guy. But regardless. That, dude, uh, well, first of all, he's been he, my guy. I'm the one who told you about Zach Kuntz. I don't know if that's true. I just like to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the prospect I did the breakdown on is Michael Mayer. And unfortunately, just like Ian Cummings did to you last episode, Logan kind of talked about him already. Uh, Your so body is wonderland. He's a uh, he's he's a junior. He's a tight end, obviously number eighty seven for the for Notre Dame. He's six four, two hundred sixty five pounds, and he's a junior. Last season, he had sixty seven receptions, eight hundred and nine yards, with nine touchdowns. In twenty twenty one, seventy one receptions, eight hundred and forty <laughs> yards, and seven touchdowns. I think Logan said it perfectly in saying that he's not a separator in the sense that he is going to be able to do what. Dalton Kincaid or Zach Kuntz are able to, with the speed of their legs, getting gaining separation from defenders. That's not going to be Michael Mayer. Michael Mayer is more like the Mark Andrews type, the heavy-footed. The, I, what I, I know that Logan said he's the number one tight end in the draft, but the injury concern with Dalton Kincaid is what puts Michael Mayer up there for me just because I feel like he has the lowest, the highest floor. If that makes sense, because yeah, oh, at yeah. least you know with Michael Mayer, he's going to run those good routes. He's going to catch the football when he's asked to, and he's also a red zone target. He was heavily utilized in college. He's a, a two-year starter, obviously, and very, very heavily uh, produced in that in that scenario. I think this is somebody he needs to be able to polish his blocking. His blocking is very soft, if we're being honest about it. So it's up there with Zach Coots and Dalton uh, and um, oh, what's the other Luke Musgrave in the way that they're yeah. blocking. Very soft. They're not maulers like Darnell Washington or Dalton Kincaid. So in that sense, I do feel like it does bring it back a little bit. And I understand what Logan says by the overall game of Dalton Kincaid is why he gets the number one nod, which I totally understand. Uh, it's just the injury concern is why I put Michael up there. But I think this is a guy that you can add day one and you feel good about it. He's already been utilized in his system at Notre Dame as a number one. They even put him on the outside. They put him at tight end. They pull him around in blocking. He just has to get polished up in his blocks. But I'm not going to say 16 is is juice, but it's Michael Mayer is weird to me, man. Like, I feel like he could go top 10, but he could also fall out of the first round. That's, in like yeah. Some it's weird odd. scenario, you know? Because we don't know what NFL teams, because like, like we've talked about, like there's such a big in this draft class, like the tight ends are all so different and they all offer so many different things. We don't know what way, like one team might have Michael Mayer way high and another team might have him as like the fourth tight end in this draft. So like, it's, it's super odd to me too, Uh, but I I like Mayer a lot. I think probably he's probably my number one tight end uh, just in terms of all around game. Um, So I'm going to go somebody else. He talked about somebody whose scouting report was easy for me to just type in real fast and find my notes. And that's, Joe Tipman, you know, we talked about him, the center from Wisconsin, who measured in at 6'6", 313 pounds. First of all, one sick mullet on this guy, at least on his uh, NFL draft profile. Draft him now. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, Number the dude 16. gets it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he's – so being 6'6 and 313, he would be – I've tied with uh, I, I don't, what's his face from the Bills. That's the tallest center in the NFL because six six, yeah, six six is big for a center. Like that, that's yeah. pretty damn tall. So that kind of plays into his weaknesses a little bit. Like it, his bendability at that size, kind of leading with his head down and shoulders down, is, is always Leverage. tough. But yeah, but um, he is a surprisingly good athlete for that size. I mean, he seems to twist well. He seems to know what he's doing pre snap. He seems to protect his gaps, especially the a gap, really well, and kind of see when somebody's going to do a delayed blitz or, or or where it's coming from. He's good in the run game too. I mean, because when you're that size and you're getting a little running start at somebody, it's it's going to be well. I didn't watch many games where he was lined up consistently with a nose tackle directly over him or or defensive tackle over him, but. So I might have to go back and watch some of that, but he so you're seems it's like it's not like he has a blocker in front of him at all times. Usually oh, no, he's yeah, well, at least at least second level. I've only watched a game and a half of his, so okay. I'm sure that he has. But from what I saw, I didn't see much of it. But he is, dude. He's very good. He, he like I said, you can see why he's considered 
a high draft pick. You're probably a day two guy. And I really do think he could switch over and play guard if you needed him to. So I think that positional versatility would really make him valuable. And the one more thing on Michael Merritt, like I just thought of it while you were talking. I apologize to go back on this. But, <sighs> cool. you know, like with Dalton Kincaid, he caught a lot of balls underneath because he has that speed to be able to get upfield, get a lot of yardage afterwards. Michael Mayer, not in that sense, but they do do the Notre Dame does do that in the red zone because of his big body being 265. They throw it behind the line of scrimmage in order to for him to get to the goal line. And I feel like that's another area where Michael Mayer kind of that body size, the strength to be able to pull push through guys gives you another avenue, another outlet down in the red zone to score points for you. So I feel like he just, he helps you in that scenario. I, I really did like Michael Mayer's tape. I, I thought that maybe he was like a Kelsey-esque type of guy. He's not, you know, his feet are not as light as Kelsey's are. He's much more nimble on his feet, which, you know, it is what it is. We all can't be Kelsey, right. man. Kelsey's yeah. like a freak of nature. You know, apparently it's not Kelsey. They, uh, You know, they have a podcast. They yeah. Their dad, come on. And uh, he said that they that's how his dad's always pronounced it, but apparently it's Kels, which is just weird. That is weird. Travis Kels. Yeah, Travis Kels. I don't Kels. like it. I don't like it. Very weird. Not one bit. All right. Now let's move on to our first fan question. And this one is from the Colonel, who sent me a article from NFLanalysis.net. Do you and it's about the Chargers trading away um, Austin Eckler to the commanders. And so the Colonel's question to you read, do you put any stock in the train trade rumors sending Austin Eckler to the commanders for Antonio Gibson and a fifth round pick? Mm. Um, I do not put any stock in it, but they, I could see if, if they were planning on moving on from Gibson, that would make sense to include him in the trade and not giving up too high of a pick or, you know, I mean, cause you're not going to resign Antonio Gibson more than likely anyway. But uh, and plus Eckler's kind of a do it all. He would compliment uh, Brian Robinson very well. But I also think Eckler is somebody that's going to be he's going to demand a lot of touches. And obviously you can use that. But I just don't see that being like I don't see. Of course, also Eckler can upgrade you, but I don't see it being that big, like getting too much money tied up in it and being that big of a like it's not going to elevate you that much. To You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't put any stock into it, but. Crazier things have happened, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like crazier things have happened, like, um, like Kyle getting a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you're I'll show myself. Out, um, you know? No, I understand what you're saying, and the one thing for me though, I absolutely love the idea of it. To be perfectly honest with you, because Austin Eckler really does bring eyes away from everyone else. Right. Terry McLaurin would be able to eat alive in one on ones because the defense would have to be so dedicated to making sure that they have straps on Austin Eckler at all times, just because he offers that big playability. Right. And the fact that they wouldn't be paying heavily for him this year, and all they're doing is swapping him with Antonio Gibson and a fifth round pick, that that is great production in a sense. But in the same yeah. breath, right. I also am against it because I feel like Antonio Gibson can do what Austin Eckler does and you were already paying him cheap. So there's no reason to really have to go down that route because he's on his, still his rookie deal. It's not like he's getting paid an exuberant amount. And also you're with Brian Robinson here. You're kind of retaining his overall production and his usage and prolonging his career. So it's a better for him in that sense. So with this, I, I, I don't put much stock into it. Because there's so many, this is the time where it's smoke screen season. All you're going to get is everyone speculating and assuming and guessing. And so at this point, I, I wouldn't put much stock into it, but I love the idea of it, if that makes sense. And now we are joined by our next guest, Deuce from In The Lab Podcast. How are you doing tonight, What's brother? What's good, fellas? What's, What's up, good, man? man? How y'all been? Uh, doing well, great, man. We better just, now. Yeah, we just yeah, talked yeah, to, yeah. Logan. to Logan. And then... Ah, the worst, and look, dude. and Deuce, <laughs> like you know, we're in the spaces all the time together. Uh, we, we're, I'm in the uh, your community, the 54th. That you started with others in the community, and obviously, if anybody watch, if you like to go follow them, you absolutely should be involved with the community. If you are a Commanders fan, it's a great group of people, and Deuce does a good job of monitoring. I'm not gonna say you know, dig, say monitoring the situation monitoring, make sure, yeah, yeah. and make sure everybody <laughs> is all good. He does a very good job at that. But uh, the Colonel's question to us, Deuce, because you know we get into these. Crazy crazy hypothetical questions all the time in the spaces. But the Colonel asked, do you put much stock into the rumor of Washington sending um, Antonio Gibson in a fifth round pick to the chargers for Austin Eckler? Yeah. Um, no, to me, it really doesn't make any sense to do that. Right. I mean, on, on both ends, right. I mean, how much more are you going to get with Austin Eckler that we don't think we can presumably get with 
Antonio Gibson. And I always go back to the first game last year against the Jaguars that really showed his full arsenal of what he can be on this team. And having somebody like EBN, I think EBN can tap into that. And then on the Chargers side, I mean, this is a this is a running back, right? Going into his last year, he's 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 been injured. And most of the time, you don't pay running backs a second contract. So, I mean, what they're really getting is is a fourth round pick. I I I, I just don't think it it makes sense. But if it does happen, I wouldn't be upset about it. Or I would Who's not. not going to take Austin Eckler. It's just we don't need. It. It's just not like yeah, it, dude. That would just be need. so stupid to add. It would yeah. Yeah, yeah, just be so, so many stupid. other things. It, like if they were focused on running back right now as like the number one priority, like that, I would be like, "What are you guys doing? Why right. is this a thing right now?" And Focus on the corner and the line says. linebacker. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah, let's well, go, let's go to our next fan question, and this was submitted in the Discord chat server. Deuce, this is from our guy Tim Towner. Appreciate you, sir. He saw this question on Instagram: Is Chase Young a bust? Uh oh. All right, so. <laughs> When we talk about Chase Young, uh, we really talk about the expectations that were set on him. Mm-hmm. That's basically what it is. The expectations that were set on him and the pick that that he was. Um, he was never like that 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 Nick Bosa type to bend the edge, to beat you with speed, to have these many tools in the his toolbox. Right. Pressure, right. Yeah, yeah. He was he, he was mostly power first step. You know, um, being able to freak. right, 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 being able to set the edge, dissect plays. You know, he's very, he's smart. He can, he can sense out the screens and different things like that. But Chase to me is just not going to be a guy that's going to get you twelve sacks. Um, and that's mainly what people is judging Chase off. It's just the sacks. They don't look at everything else that matters: the pressures, the hurries, uh, being one of the best run blocking edges, and all those other different type of things that matter. People are only looking at sacks and how many guys in the sacks is constantly getting 12 to 15 sacks a year i mean come on like Maybe like it's 17 three, games four, played right. right it's 17 games played getting eight sacks should be like wow thank you for any d defense and because if sacks was that easy people would be having like 30 40 of them a year right <laughs> you're absolutely right about that and no tim i don't think chase young is a bust but the problem is arising with the injuries because that always that happens with rookies. And regardless, the the player isn't a bust, but the pick is the bust, if that makes sense. And no disrespect to the player, I believe in Chase Young. I really do. L- let's equate this to Robert Griffin III, right? Robert Griffin III's career to check trajectory was very high and then it sloped down right chase young is is not in that sense where he's still at kind of the middle with his injury but he still has time and the one thing that rg3 did not do is he was not willing to listen and get better on his own self and wanting to progress and do better if that makes sense when kirk cousins got benched the first thing he did and when jay gruden benched him is he went to a qb coach and he reworked on all of his tools he made himself better as a passer, so when that opportunity came, he was ready to go. And I think that's what Chase Young should have been doing this past season and this offseason. I think watching tape on guys like Jared Allen, watching guys like Julius Peppers would go a long way for Chase Young because they were not built on speed. They were built on length. They were built on height and strength, and that's what Chase Young can do. And uh, what's unfortunate for Chase is that Chase's career was never built on just getting sacks. It was always being an all-around difference maker in the run game, commanding two or three blocks, and that's what he was doing in his first year. It's unfortunate that he got as injured as he did because he hasn't been able to prove it yet again, but I think at the end of this season has shown you that the the progress and production is coming again. We just got to have a little bit of faith. And so, uh, no, Chase Young is not a bust. I believe in him. Yeah, no, so do do I. And Kind of like what Deuce was saying, it's not – Chase isn't a, it's like a a thing of, it's a weird, perfect storm of like all these scenarios that happened with Chase. It was like unreal expectations, a fantastic rookie year where he won a defensive rookie of the year and made this defense a lot better. A sophomore slump, which was kind of to be expected, then a devastating injury that made him miss a lot of time and that he still kind of bounced back, back from mentally. So like the fan base has kind of this negative view on him, but Chase is going to be fine. Chase, I really do believe that. I really think Chase Young is going to be okay because you know the dude has the work ethic. You know that the guy wants it. You know that he's smart. You know what he can bring to this defense. And you're right. He might not ever be a 12 to 15 sacks kind of guy like everybody expected when he was coming out. And that's 
part of I mean that's part of scouting like that's just what it is you're right he's not some but he does everything well he does do a lot of things very well and he's very valuable to a defense and he can really pump you up look at Brandon Graham Brandon Graham was never a guy going out there getting double digit sacks every year but he's considered one of the best defensive ends in all of football because he does everything he's so good at doing everything Chase Young people forget man his rookie year he made some plays that you don't see defensive ends make (laughs) like you just don't like the dude is unreal and I really think as long as he can clear the mental hurdles he'll get back there and everybody will be shut the fuck up about him finally for a little bit like people just need to pump the brakes on it got to keep in mind what this kid's been through and it's the one thing is, is him being a leader uh just being that kind of uh voice uh image that is polarizing i think also brings a lot of um production in the sense that it brings an identity to the defensive line he brings them together and remember the the taylor heineke pointing the back of his jersey you know chase young has brought brings more than just obviously the stats and the sacks and right. stuff like that. But he's very, very important just in a human level. But now this next question from Tim Towner, Deuce. Who will be the next O-line coach? Is it Juan Castillo, uh, Travell Wharton, or the mystery coach behind door number three? <laughs> uh, so the whole thing about the Masco firing, um, if, if, if you really believe it was because of scheme and fit, then it's definitely not going to be Wharton, right? Because – that's basically what he's been doing right. the last few years. So yeah. we we know that's that's not going to be the case. Um, Castillo has obviously history coach history coaching O line. Um, he has history coaching uh, with EB. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the move, um, or just trying to bring someone in. The only thing about bringing someone in now is that everyone is already in the groove of things, right? If right. He, you know, Andy, Andy probably like, look, you ain't going to just keep taking people and this, this and that. Right. <laughs> so and even in the college ranks, they're preparing for like spring ball. They already got an emotion with it. So I, I think it's going to kind of be like a default thing where it's going to be Warden. And that's because that's who he wants. But that's just like the, the position and predicament that we're in right now. Yeah, I think Deuce uh, actually brought up a very good point uh, talking about Travell Warden and the technique of things. Um, Obviously. John Masco being a more tenured uh, kind of coach, you could see why he'd be more reluctant in order to change what he was doing and right. how he's been taught. Um, what maybe Travell Wharton is more open minded and willing yeah. to work because he knows what EB brings to the table. That possibility is always out there. Um, so I wouldn't hate either one of these moves because I think the move of Juan Castillo to tight ends coach to replace Pete Hayner was a head scratcher in itself. And I think it kind of proves now what the the stars aligning in a sense where Juan Castillo most likely is going to be the O-line coach. It's just finding somebody to bring in for that tight end to make you feel really, really good if you do need, or just an assistant because you're going to promote the uh, assistant tight end. I mean, it, 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 it might be some type of dual thing. Right. Like, right. If they yeah, can't oh, yeah, find yeah, him, like, Castillo yeah, I mean, might end up being like either. a tight end O-line right. coach title yeah. or something. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, hit up uh, my best friend, former guest on the show, guest earlier, Logan Paulson. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, come on, Logan. <laughs> come come make all these other tight ends average to below average. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're so mean to him, man. I love Logan. Dude. <laughs> That's so a relationship. Uh, cool. Now, this next question is from Andy Lockhart in the Discord chat server. Oi! Thank you, Andy. Should we hold Dallas over a fire regarding the drafting of Bijan Robinson? Scare them to death with us saying publicly we want him. So then Dallas panics into some sort of trade just to mess up their draft strategy. <laughs> draft strategy, draft strategy, right? Um, I mean, I don't know. You know, if you, if you want to play those games, that's 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 fine. I mean, it's happening now, right? It's, they call this the the lion season, and, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, but if Dallas really wants him, it's not going to matter if we say we're going to get him or not. Uh, Jerry's going to do whatever he needs to do as proven to go up and get Bijan if that's who he wants. Yeah. Absolutely, dude. Look, I want to be able to be in the mindset of our coach, our team saying, I don't care who the hell you have active. You could get Bron- exactly. Brian Barry Sanders. It doesn't matter. We're going <laughs> to hold you to less than 100 yards rushing like we have done in the past. Um, that's why I want to go down. But first and foremost, Andy, I think it's a lot like driving. If you're dedicated, if you're invested in screwing over the Cowboys, you're taking your eyes off the wheel, off the road. Exactly. You got to yeah. keep looking forward down the road. Yes, you could help yourself if the scenario brings itself to you to say, oh, yeah, we could always screw with the Cowboys by doing this, and it helps us at the same time. That would make sense. But if your first motive is to screw over the Cowboys, mm-hmm. I feel like you're going to be putting yourself in a bad situation because you should be worrying about making yourself better, not trying to make them worse as your yeah. first go-to. Well, that makes sense. 
I will say I'm always down. Just screw over the Cowboys. It's fine with me. I, so I, lo- I love where your mind's at, Andy, but they kind of touched on all the bases. So I will just say, wasn't the best lying smokescreen move of all time when the 49ers conned the Bears into taking Mitch Trubisky and trading up one pick and getting all those extra picks? That was the funniest thing in the world. They weren't going to take him. They had no intention of taking Mitch Trubisky. And the Bears were like, we got to get up there. Because Kyle Shanahan kind of has Dude, a, it was a history so with this though. kind of... Uh, I know, but like yeah. they got extra picks, moved back one spot, and still got the player that they wanted. Yeah. Granted, I think it was Solomon Thomas. He didn't pan out. But yeah, he didn't. He funny. didn't at all. It is whatever, <laughs> man. Now, this next question is from Big Tony Shivers in the Discord, Deuce. If the team wants to add another running back to the mix, who are some mid to late round running backs that you'd like? Um, You got what? Spears? Um, I think, I, yeah, I think, I think he's a guy that I wouldn't mind um, targeting there. And then you have, um, oh man, I can't think of his name. Uh, Give me a school. Machine. Sh- Devin chain. A cane? Yeah. A, a, a chain it, it's, cane, it's a chain it. apparently. Um, a a WCC yeah, yeah, would made, made uh, fun of me because I kept saying a cane. He's yeah. like, it's a chain, bro. A chain, a chain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's his name. Um, I, I, I really like him, but um, I think he's, he's going to go, uh, day two, I think he's climbing some boards. Uh, but if we're looking for a day three person, it's, it's going to be Spears. And um, to me, and I think it's another guy named Brown. Um, some people were looking at, I think Chase Brown, is that his name? Yeah, from Illinois. Yeah, from Illinois. So, But I really want to get someone either late third with that comp pick, uh, if someone kind of falls, or someone early um, day three in the fourth round with our fourth round pick. I think we need to add to this room because regardless what type of season – uh, Gibby has unless it's like 2,000 yards rushing or mm-hmm. 1,500 all-purpose yards, something like that. He's not looking. I'm not looking to give him um, a second contract. So I want to bring someone that kind of that kind of fits that mode a little bit um, that we could kind of you know have in the room after next season. Yeah, just to put this, if you don't know me very well, it's cool, guys. But I just will, if I pronounce something wrong, it's because I've been reading it and I haven't heard it. Like yeah. I don't watch TV, yeah, so, yeah. so I don't like I listen think most to what how words are pronounced. So I'm reading it, and that's how I'm just doing it. But hey, look, like you got you learn something new every day. All right, baby. That's right. That's now, right. Tony, uh, for me, a running back that what I envision for that third running back now that JD McKissick is gone is somebody that you could step in right away in an emergency situation and be able to do everything that the first two do. Right. So you have to be able to get somebody who can run in between the tackles, who can get extra yardage in, pu- in being able to push through uh, tackles. You got to be able to have a guy who could catch out of the backfield. And so I think that kind of limits where you are in the mid to late rounds. I think a guy like Eric Gray is somebody who kind of fits that. I think pass blocking is kind of underrated uh, as for his sake. Um, but I do think that somebody like Prince, I forget, I don't know how to say his last name, a better Becky. I don't know how to say it. The dude from Pitt? Yeah, from Pitt. Yeah, um, and he's it, somebody yeah. that I think if you go like in the third round, like let's just say Eric Bien- yeah, my, my goodness, he just ran a full three. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it's stupid. Yeah, like, let's, just say Eric, yeah it's... Like, let's just say Eric Bien- And he, he's like, I'm here. sorry to cut you off, but he's, he's like 5'10", 2-something. Like 215, yeah, yeah. running a full three. My goodness. Jesus dude, Christ. that's a fast bowling ball, <laughs> isn't it? That's, it is. Dude. And, like, for me, like, that kind of thing is, like, if Eric Bieniemy has that power because he's the new guy, right, and so he's the princess, he's the princess of the ball, well, he had that control and power to say, I need my guy, this is him, go get him, and I would be okay with that in the third round. But if we're talking the later round guys, I would absolutely love, like, somebody from Keaton Mitchell from East Carolina who has some history in being able to return punts and doing a good job with it. If you guys can remember, I did a film breakdown on him, yep. the one that got us yep. in trouble uh, because yep. I had uploaded mm-hmm. it on here. But he returned punts as well. And so I feel like that's somebody that can do all three phases for you and help you in the special teams and being an asset in a punt return. So I would absolutely love a guy like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you guys touched on some good ones. I'll just say a, a day three guy that I'm interested in, just like if you're looking at somebody who can come in and help and kind of fill that J.D. McKissick role is Evan Hall from Northwestern. Mm. He's been productive in college. I mean, I mean, if you look at his pass catching numbers, it's insane. And he, he's good at lining up in the slot. I think last year, let me see right here he last year he had 55 catches for 546 yards as a running back like that's pretty good especially in college so he's somebody measured in 510 209 he ran a 447 i believe so he's somebody who can kind of do it all and he's really good he shines as a pass catcher and he's somebody who's projected to go day three so he's gonna be all right taking a flyer on him yeah i agree with you now this next question in discord chats from scott hartley in the uk oh thank you scott Deuce, what position group would you be most annoyed at if we stay and pick at 16? 
So you say if we stay and and don't pick, or if we, we do... do pick at sixteen, like if what's one position group? If we pick that position at sixteen, you'd be pissed. <laughs> um, wide receiver. Um, I don't for for one, I don't, I I don't I don't really see a guy. I mean, you have right. you have Addison. Um, uh, you have the three letter syllable receiver. I forgot, I can't think of his name. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, Jackson Smith. Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go. Um, but I, I'm I'm not impressed with those guys, especially at 16, especially where um, we we have two wide receivers that are, are are pretty good. I don't think any one of those guys would be someone that I can say, oh, you know what? They're going to challenge Jahan Dotson. So if I don't have any one of those guys that I believe that can do that in the draft, I would definitely be annoyed if we pick a wide receiver at 16. I think it's very easy just for humor's sake. I mean, I think I think we would all say defensive tackle <laughs> in the first round. Oh, yeah. Just for yeah, obvious yeah. reasons. <laughs> um, but let's just do it to do a harder one. I'll say running back in the first round. And just because of the talent pool that you do have there, obviously a running back could that of that caliber could really help your offense. But you already have those running backs. You saw what the Chiefs did last season. And with the seventh rounder in Pacheco, obviously it's a different offense, different scheme, but showing that this offensive coordinator and the help with his coaches were able to get a lot of production out of a seventh round pick. And so you can still get similar production. If you have a go- good O-line run blocking for you, you don't have to have that shape shifter in order to be pr- uh, have production on the ground and scoring a lot of points. Because that's number one, objective number one, scoring a lot of points. I get it, and that's what some running running backs would be able to do for you but the problem is there's weaknesses in this conference and you have to be able to match those those strengths I mean with your weaknesses you have to be able to do it you have to look ahead based on how the future looks and uh I, I I'd be pissed with running back man. yeah Just right and, and so obviously defensive tackle that's a big one but another one I'll say and it's not it's not because it's not a need. It's just because I don't like a lot of the guys that would be there at 16, and that's linebacker. I'm if, Look, I'm all for taking a linebacker early, but if it's day two, more so. Like, I'm down to take one on day two. We want one. I think that we need one. But linebackers are kind of becoming so, like, non-existent. Like, you used to, we used, what, three linebackers, 10 plays total last season? Yeah. And if you're going to roll with Cody Barton and, uh, and uh, Jamin, which, I mean, I think that's the, the way things are pointed right now. Like, I would rather – get somebody who can come in and fill that third safety spot and somebody that, you know, but I, I, and also I just don't like a lot of the, or either of the linebackers like Trenton Simpson. I like him, but I wouldn't want to take him at 16. I just think it's too, I don't know. It just doesn't I could offer see, enough. I could see them going down with Trenton Simpson because he's also an edge rusher. Very good at rushing the quarterback. If and you so can bring like, that. Right. Right. You know, we, we heard true. Logan still, talk about getting that edge because you don't yeah. know the, the future of our edge rushers. Well, you could be, killing two birds with one stone with Trent Simpson getting Mm -hmm. a good linebacker in coverage, but also a a very good pass rusher as well. I'm sure, but guess what, Kyle? You're wrong, okay? I agree (laughs) with you, though. I would actually would be... I just trying to... I would be kind of disappointed with Trent Simpson, obviously, but I would have to look more into it to understand what It just doesn't excite you, you know? Like, if this was a long time ago and you were about to be like, damn, we're about to have three stud linebackers, hell yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it doesn't happen anymore. (laughs) The Rocky (laughs) McIntosh days are over. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That was my dude, man. Yeah. Loved Rocky. Now, last question for you. I'm not sure if Orange Crush actually submitted this into us, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and I think it's a really good question. Do you think Real fast, Charles... if this was Jeremiah Trotter, Jesse Armstead, and LeVar Arrington days, you'd be like, hell yeah, that's a sick linebacker tree. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle. Keep going. But the question is, Deuce, do you think Charles Leno can hold it down at offensive tackle next year? Uh, yes. Uh, the, <laughs> the thing about Charles Leno is that um, if you look at his stats, you look at his numbers across you know, the different engines or whatever you want to use, Like he's a top 15 tackle in, in this league looking at the numbers. Um, the thing with Charles Leno is that the same thing with, with Fuller. Like, I kind of say they're the same person on, on opposite sides of the ball. When he gets beat, he gets beat bad. Yeah. And it shows up and it's, a, it's, mo- it's monumentous and it, and it impacts the game dramatically. And because he gets one or two of those a game, the whole outlook to Charles Leno is, hey, man, we need to get rid of him. You know what I mean? But if you kind of take those out, um, I think he's a serv- serviceable um, left tackle in, in, in this league. 
Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I do think that Charles Leno can hold it down offensive tackle last season. Um, obviously, he had all the snaps on offense at left tackle, so, yeah. which shows you. And look, I was harsh on him when he got beat by Kayvon Thibodeau. But he got destroyed. And the Kayvon reason Thibodeau. why I was very upset wasn't because it was it was Charles Leno who got beat. The reason why I was upset was because that was the difference in the game. There was an eight-point difference in the in the total score. And that touchdown was the, obviously the difference maker. But other teams score more points on offense. And so when their left tackles give up a sack touchdown, it doesn't. it's not as looked at. It's not as magnified because right. they're actually scoring points. Right. And that's what you can't put on Charles Leno. And that's what I had to learn myself because I was being – I was very, I was being harsh on Charles, uh, obviously, yeah. but I do think that he can hold it down. Look, you're going to get beat sometimes. They're, these are professional athletes; they're really freaking good. But there's sometimes, especially in prime time, up in on our own goal line, if you got to block a rookie, I hope you'd be able to do that, Charles. That's all I'm hoping for. Especially a rookie who doesn't even know who Joe Thomas is. But <laughs> hey, I, I, no, can Charles Leno hold it down for another? Year? Of course he can. He's there's nothing really wrong with Charles. Charles Leno is this very solid tackle. He's a smart veteran and a. I think we were all very hard. I've been hard on him. Everybody has been this past year. But, yeah, you still got to feel confident with Charles Leno in there. I mean, he wasn't really – he wasn't the problem last no, season. Not he really all. wasn't. He did He was one of the job. better performing offensive and look, to be and if we all just when he got beat, it was pretty bad. Right. And <laughs> if we if we all could play left tackle in the NFL, we would be up there. It's very, very oh, yeah, hard no, to I do could, that. Probably. I probably. Right. Could. And so it's okay. very hard to do that. So we got to cut the guy some slack. But we do want to see better out of it, uh, more production. We want to see Charles progress because – we want to be able not to worry about that left side. We're just looking for Charles to give us the reason to believe in that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. But before we get out of here, Deuce, just want to give you a little bit of moment. I know I briefly talked about it probably in a very in very poorly. Uh, I did. No, you you did want to talk about the 54th? Job. And uh, just, just in case anybody out there would like to come get involved, brother. Yeah, so it's um, the 54th is about all of the fans – um, Washington franchise, like right from the Braves all the way up um, to the commanders, kind of coming together, trying to build back up um, our uh, um, community. And we're calling it the 54th because those that don't know, originally, we were originally the 12th, the, the 12th man in 87 on a Super Bowl. They had a song about it and all that. But of course, the, the you know, the, the sale happened and we just started going down. We wasn't winning. So Seattle just came in. And took it. So yeah, what we're trying to do, up in Washington right, 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 it, yeah. right. <laughs> so um, we came up with um, actually uh, one of your previous guests, uh, um, Arch, Arch Deluxe, kind of heard it, and he kind of said, "Hey, look, this is a gold man. Like this, this can really work." Um, so we came up with the fifty um, fourth, uh, and um, it's about you know not all but one. We are the fifty fourth. It's been kind of in the working for about eight months. It's actually um, on a desk of um, President uh, Jason Wright. So um, that's also good. You know, it was gaining some momentum. But then Bank of America came in and said, hey, look, we're going to stop all this. So mm -hmm. um, it kind of stopped. So we kind of went, went back to the table. We asked a lot of content creators, and you all were one of them um, about the idea. So you all had kind of like the inside scoop a few months before um, everyone else. And if you have a look at the logo, it has the 54th on there. It has a skyline in Washington, D.C. of the city, and it has 21 stars. And we all know what that represents, yeah, Sean it Taylor. It is a sick-ass logo. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's what it is. We're on Twitter at 54th. Um, Facebook, the same thing, at 54th. Instagram at 54th. Just come join. Join the community. And uh, we're looking to do a whole lot of things with this. Um, we're looking to get into charity. Um, we have the, all, all fans across the whole country. Um, we're meeting up with them, saying how we can help in their communities. And we're, we're, we're really trying to grow this to be really, really something that we all can look back and all can be um, a part of. Yeah, I'll tell you right now, dudes, I think it's very important for this franchise to have some stability in a sense and trying to bring back some sort of pride. Um, back to this area is something that has been missing for a long time. I think it's very smart by the two of you uh, to get it started, and you've done a great job with it. So I would, I'm telling you my personal experience. I've been, I'm in the group chat with these guys, and I'm in the community. It's really a welcoming community of all ages, of all types, of all different people. Uh, it's just the only common theme is that we're all Commanders fans. Yep. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters, really. And we have really good uh, discussions. There are arguments, but at the same mm -hmm. time, everyone is cool about it because yeah. you understand that this is all just for fun, baby. 
All right, That's everybody. Right. That's going to wrap us up for this episode, Deuce. I can't thank you enough, brother. You know, yeah. it's always good to see your face after we're always just talking in spaces, mm -hmm. uh, just Let's looking at our cell phones. All right, everybody. That's going to wrap us up for this episode. Y'all be nice on that timeline now, you hear? <laughs> yeah, Reed. <laughs> I'm always nice. I, don't I know, know you, you are always about. nice, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm just too honest about shit, I guess. You know? <laughs> Stop. All right, everybody. That's going to wrap us up for this episode. We'll see you again on Monday. I'm Kyle. A lot of guys. I don't know. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you then. Have a great and safe weekend. Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Woo!